everyone. Welcome to WordCamp Asheville. I know you guys have been here through lunch already, and I'm um, really uh, excited to be here. Uh, I've spoken here a couple of years uh, in a row on some WordPress topics, and I also um, run and manage WordPress Chapel Hill, uh, meet up here from Asheville, uh, which is kind of a weird situation, but we, do, we managed to do it. And um, I was just out at WordCamp Raleigh uh, six weeks ago uh, speaking on some WordPress topics. So it's always exciting for me to share my knowledge uh, and the experience uh, that I have uh, with all of you. Uh, I've been working in the world of WordPress uh, since 2004. Um, I'm on the WordPress uh, Codex as Tony Zioli, and I've got a, a bunch of contributions over 300 um, times. I've helped other people on the WordPress.org Codex. So if you're involved in the WordPress community, I implore you or urge you or engage you to go to WordPress.org, sign up for a user account if you don't have one already, and get involved in the WordPress community as I've done and probably some of you have done here uh, to make sure that we continue the cycle uh, of contribution to growing uh, this community beyond its incredible growth already, powering 28% of the internet and I think 65 or 67% of all installed CMSs. Um, just a little background about me. I usually write some text crap, but I was like, hey, let me take some screenshots, and that's my stuff, <laughs> right? So I got LinkedIn, I'm on Twitter, there's my Facebook business uh, personal, I have a personal page, but that's kind of like my consulting page, and then uh, my website. I also run Digital Strategy Works, a digital strategy agency that I've had since 2009, and that's really starts the topic of this conversation is that I've been involved in WordPress um, for so long, but I also have a 23-year digital media career that goes back to 1993-94 when I had my first startup. Um, most people are just hearing about startups today, but uh, I've been involved in, in digital um, since Web 1.0, which uh, just to kind of cycle back, uh, was a really a read-only. It was, I pushed out content to you, and you read it. There was Web 2.0, where it was read, write, publish, where I pushed content out to you, then you could comment on it, and you could then get in Blogger, or before WordPress, there was um, Blogspot and, and TypePad, and then WordPress. Uh, and then came Web 3.0, which we know as Google and Semantic Search, and you know, really intelligent websites, you know, figure, figuring out uh, your inputs and kind of sending you back information based on those inputs. And then we have mobile responsive, uh, and we're moving into Web 5.0, which is artificial intelligence. Things like amy.ix, if anybody knows what that is. It's like I can send you, you I can send an email out and the intelligent, and artificial intelligence sends back a schedule for you to respond to and then ping pongs back and forth and then the schedule set. So there's all, I've been around watching uh, uh, living through all the innovation and the evolution of software products, you know, for, for many years, um, since really the true beginning of the internet. And in every cycle that I've lived, I've realized that I've had to stop buying into everything that people wanted to sell me and start standardizing my workflow, uh, uh, for how I felt I could run my business efficiently and effectively as really a one-man shop with a bunch of freelancers uh, who work for me. Uh, we didn't have the connective tissue of the APIs that we have today to do all the cool things that we can do. So we're really overwhelmed, and I think somebody mentioned it in a business track uh, earlier, just overwhelmed, uh, I think it was a marketing uh, earlier this morning, just overwhelmed with uh, inputs and outputs and, and information. And, you know, I go back to a time where I was in AOL, ch AOL chat rooms. People use Slack today, but really Slack is just AOL chat room on steroids. I mean, inherently it's channel based. You type in, you get a message, you send a message back, and okay, so now you can upload files and you can connect with the APIs, you can connect other web services, which you couldn't do back then. But it just goes, goes back to the mindset of, you know, the innovation. Uh, that we've uh, seen evolve uh, o over the course of the last so many years. Uh, and so I wanna start this presentation talking from a little bit of a philosophical level. And I'll just preface that by saying this is the first time I've given this specific talk. Uh, I was excited about it because it's something that uh, I wrote about on LinkedIn. Uh, I just was sitting there one day and thinking, 
oh, you know, I really have figured it out. I've standardized. I'm going to write about it. And so I wrote off this great LinkedIn article that's only been shared eight times. And, and it's, you know, but hopefully, you know, you know uh, you'll leave here today and you'll go to that article and you'll remember me and maybe you'll share it forward and maybe those ideas will be put forth. Um, but when I say innovation, evolution causes innovation. Innovation fueled by problem solving, right? We all want to solve problems. Problem solving spawns ideation. Ideation creates solutions. Solutions are adopted by tribes. So I want to, to bridge this into tribes. We're all inherently uh, tribes. We coalesce around solutions to solve problems in our own world or in other tribes around us that have like, you know, like their shared interests, right? And so what is a tribe? Um, some, my wife is a cultural uh, communicator and international educator, and she said, don't make sure you don't use the word tribe incorrectly. And explain what you mean by tribe, because some people in North Carolina might be offended. So, <laughs> so I said, okay, I'll explain what tri tribe in anthropology, according to Encyclopedia Britannica, is, an, is a notional form of human social organization based on a smaller set of groups known as bands, having temporary or permanent political integration and defined by traditions of common descent, language, culture, and ideology, right? Um, today's tribes, though, in the marketing world, you've heard the word tribe used in marketing, especially in social media, despite, uh, this comes from HubSpot, um, who are really um, pushing forward the notion of, of tribes and camps and, and, and whatnot and bands. Despite the years of evolution technology that have created the foundation we currently stand on, there is one common denominator that has remained unchanged, even after centuries of growth, the inherent desire to form tribes, right? To, to, to form a group um, of interested um, parties, you know, persons or, or whatever have you that are, are all engaged and pushing forward an idea and, and adopting that idea. Historically speaking, a tribe was a community of families that bonded over one goal to survive and raise their next generations. Today, however, we can define tribes as something less critical, like individuals who are linked by their social interests, right? And HubSpot writes more about this, but we get the point is that we're all, in some essence, we, we all have, there's the yoga tribe, right, in Nashville. There's the AK, Applied Kinesiology tribe. There's the Naturopath tribe, right? We, there's the, the restaurant tribe, the foodies, right? The, we all have tribes and we all have needs and we all want to solve problems. Um, and, our tri and our tribes can be competing, right? There's the WordPress tribe of all of us. Then there's the plugin developers, the theme developers, the SEO experts, the social media managers, the bloggers, the form builders, the analytics analysts, the digital marketers, the podcasters, the videographers, the photographers. There's so many people that need to be addressed. There's so many tribes that tap into the singular tribe of WordPress to be serviced, to be consulted, to be... Um, delivered solutions to, you know, that it can become, uh, you know, a real problem, and we'll get to that, right? So common traits uh, in a tribe are, uh, are leadership, trust, community, and these are things that I, I didn't look this up. I just thought, you know, as an educated person, I thought these are the keywords that are traits that a tribe that I want to belong to, right? A shared knowledge, um, accountability, support, security, context, and popularity, right? So, you know, when we talk about leadership, um, we look to uh, individuals in the WordPress universe for leadership on certain things, like the person who came here today to talk about page speed optimization. I'm looking to him to join his tribe on leadership on that issue. Right, and then that, and, and we have to build trust. Of course, trust. I don't know what trust is anymore in this political environment, but you know, it's it's. I hope it's still there in the un bubbling underground somewhere. But uh, but we have to build trust in the person that's explaining. You have to build trust in me that explain. You're my tribe now in this room, and I'm explaining to you my philosophy. And you have the trust that I know what I'm talking about. That I've gone through these things. That I have a process that I've worked through, and that maybe my process will work for you. And then you buy into that and you pass it forward, right? And then this community of all of us who are working on these. Uh, common shared goals together. There's economic advantages or disadvantages in the decisions that we make um, based on the tools, the technologies. Uh, the gentleman who spoke earlier, Nick, about pricing, you know, about how much should I charge, how little should I charge. There are all these variable factors that go into your 
overall WordPress workflow uh, and what you do every day. So um, I, I do want to just say maybe I just talk philosophy and my ideas, and maybe you walk away with just hearing me talk, but the purpose of hearing me talk is to kind of jigger or rejigger something in you that says, oh, you know what, I never really thought of it like that. Oh, maybe I should be working towards that goal. Or, yes, I've thought of it like that. Thank you for um, confirming my suspicions or confirming my workflow, right? So, so I hope that what we get out of this talk today are those types of um, outcomes, right? Uh, and that shared knowledge, right? Uh, so there's accountability, you know, I need to know what I'm talking about to be able to deliver information to you, or I need to know how to build a plugin to be able to have it, you know, work functionally or a website work functionally for my client or whatever have you. Then the support, I have to always, um, you know, we want people in our tribe to maintain, to, uh, to offer support. So I'll give you an example. Um, I, I use, and I'll get into this in the theme framework, but I use a theme framework called theme, uh, Make by Theme Foundry, the Theme Foundry. Everyone's running to Divi. Everyone else is running to Avada Fusion. But I found these, this theme framework, and I trust them. I think they provide leadership. I like their little community. They're reasonably priced. Um, they share knowledge with me all the time. They're accountable, and they get back to me when they say they're supposed to. They give me the support that I need in 24 hours. They're secure, right? They provide context all the time with their blog and some of the things that they're doing. And they're somewhat popular within the structure of what they do uh, and, the, and the number of websites that they power. So I decided to join their tribe in my workflow. And that may not work for people that use Divi. So we'll t and we'll talk about that uh, in a little bit about how there's a, a client coming into my world with a Divi issue and then another client coming with an Avada a fusion framework, and I'll talk about how I work with those people. Um, so we talk about competing tribes, right? And my wife is a Yankees fan, and I'm a Red Sox fan, and we live in the same house. So we're competing tribes in a single household, but we sh share some common traits and values, so I guess we're both from the Northeast. But just to show you, like, the, di the, the, the diversity of tribes is that, you know, one tribe is I am just going to be this fan, and I am just going to be that fan. But if you're a digital strategist like I am, you have to work and evolve with many different tribes. And you have to convince and conjole and work with people who only want to work within their tribe, Democrats and Republicans right now, right? So um, this is probably, in some ways, a talk about that, <laughs> right? Uh, organizational, I, I brought in this slide because it may not have something to do with, well, it has something to do with tribes, but. Uh, but just, I like to talk about these three points all the time to the chagrin of my Brazilian exchange student this year who hates when I bring this up. But, uh, but I say to him all the time, Gabi, your perception is your reality. And he looks at me and he's like, oh, can't stand when you do that. <laughs> but it truly is. Uh, an organ I went back to school at a later age. Um, at NYU, and I had a great organizational behavior instructor, and she went up to the blackboard, if we had to hit, I would write it on the board, and I had never heard that up until I was 38, um, and I'm really only 39 now, but uh, 38, but, but it's true, like, when we go out there and we're working with our tools, and we're working with our clients, right, we have to remember that our perceptions are our realities. They're not the reality of the client, they're not the reality of the developer, they're not the reality of the, desi the designer. So it's our responsibility as a project manager, as an account manager, as a product manager, as a art director, right, to understand that everyone has their own perspectives and work those in to our workflow. But that becomes a challenge, right, and, and a neat challenge in terms of how we have to interact uh, and communicate with all these varied tribes and all these varied interests, right? Um, uh, one other term that I heard in my, uh, in my workflow in the, in the corporate arena was the term storming, norming, and performing, right? So I'm starting to get involved with a client uh, and I realized maybe I, uh, she asked me a single line question and I, didn't, I thought she was trying to, somebody else was trying to block me from doing something. That I uh, that that I know how to do. You know, I, I I can 
move sites onto WP Engine. I can set up SSL. I can boot cl do Cloudflare. I can do uh, an entire you know, theme framework from top to bottom, build forms, everything. But this one person was like, why does he need to do that? Why does he need to do what he's asking? And my perception was my reality. And so in that, I w we were storming, right, in the beginning of the relationship. Oh, he's want, he wants to control, and I need to know. And so there's a storming, there's a norming when you figure those things out and you start to normalize. And there's a performing when you all get together on the same page and you move forward in your potential workflow uh, with your clients or, or partners or whatever, right? Then there's Johari's window. Um, which is something that I also uh, got from my organization behavior class, which are things like, you know, uh, what do you know about yourself? What do you don't know about yourself? What are your blind spots? What is not known to others? What's known to others about you and what they can, what I can see about you, what you can see about me, what I can't see about myself, what we can't see about each other, you know, those kinds of things. So we want to build those types of psychological uh, tools into our workflow to make sure that we're addressing our clients' needs and listening and hearing them and not jumping the gun or changing the focus or whatever have you, right? These are all just simple ideas that I've heard throughout my business and personal life that I wanted to share in this talk because I think it's important in terms of strategizing how we do what we do. Uh, every day. Um, so we get to the overload point, right? I found this great graphic, right? That's just a mess. It's everything and nothing, all in a mash, in a brain. And we're on this information overload. So we have to come to some type of no, right? We have to come to some type of stop. There's competition for attention, right? Look how many plugins are on the WordPress codex. 50,554 plugins. Are you going to really install 50,000 plugins on your WordPress site? No, right? But they're all competing for your attention. So you have to decide all the things, the leadership, the accountability, the support, all of those things that I mentioned in the previous slide, you have to look to for the, you know, you can't just install a plugin and go, oh yeah, it's great, install it. Right? If you don't even check the reviews, if you don't check Who's writing the plugin? When did they start it? How many people have installed it? Is it popular? Does it have a, an add-on system where you pay for additional services? Do they respond in support? One of the number one things I do when I install a plugin is I look in the support forum and I see how long it took for someone to provide support. Now Yoast, everybody seems to love Yoast, but they don't provide free support. Why? They want to make money, so they force you into their world of paid support. All in one SEO, a client of mine and, and some friends, they provide paid and free. You know, I prefer to use them because they're going to be there for me when, when I'm not a subscriber or when my client's not a subscriber. They may not be in 15 minutes, it may be in 24 or 48 hours, but those are the differences in our workflows that we have to look at before we start installing things and going places and buying stuff, right, that we think is are going to solve a problem. There's underlying issues within every tribe of how they can accomplish their goals. There's um, one, I think, uh, I can't remember, the, I know there's a, WP Tavern's been writing about this uh, theme framework that's been going south. I forget what, which one it is. But they left their customers in the lurch, they're not responsive, they're taking subscription revenue still, right? Those are the kind, but people are still signing up, right? So we have to look around in our, in our workflow and, and, and understand what's going on. We can't just assume and just take it on, right? So there's even more competition than that, right? So now you've got 50,000 free plugins, and now you've got Theme Forest. I call it Theme Black Forest um, because it's, you know, I, I think it's god awful, but that's, that's my own personal opinion. Um, of doing this thing where they're just going to provide a marketplace. And then in the marketplace, there are 34,915 tribes, all vying for your attention, all who you don't know, and all who you have to get to know, and all who are you going to service you, like Theme Foundry, who are an independent little company over here doing the right thing, right? And so I hear a lot of uh, horror stories about people going in and then getting, uh, getting, uh, hitting a roadblock because they can't get support. 
you know, because they didn't put in their workflow the questions about the tools that they were using to add. You know, oh, somebody says it's on theme for us, I'll just go buy it and install it. Wee, let's go. Oh, you know, oh, my open graph meta tags and Avada Fusion are conflicting with my open graph meta tags and all of my SEO. I didn't know that, the, you know, how do I, how can I find that out? Where do I go, right? Those are, those are the kind of things that we need to put in our workflow to challenge ourselves to ask the questions, right? Um, and so uh, I'm reminded of all this by these guys, WP Elevation. That's my recent uh, Gmail, uh, just, just targeting their uh, domain name. You know, he's, re he's selling me on, on how to run my business. And he's reminding me every single day <laughs> about what I should be doing, right? So there's people, not only am I telling you this, there are people who are telling me this. <laughs> Right, and they're, they're telling me every hour on their automated, you know, uh, uh, in, in, uh, infusion soft marketing software, right? So we've got workflow, right? And so this is the workflow that we and look at how much stuff goes into workflow, right? Consulting, experts, management, technology improvements, all these things that we have to think about as project managers. Even if you don't think you're a project manager because you're a business owner and you ask somebody else to build a website for you, you still need to be invested in some way in the project because you want the solution, right? So all these kinds of things go into our workflow and we can't ignore them and we can't beg them off to someone else and we can't say they're not important uh, because every piece uh, is important but it can be overwhelming. So I say uh, I'm built, I've built my own toolbox, and this was the premise of the article, right? I built my own toolbox. Yeah, that's cute, right? <laughs> I was going to get a regular red toolbox, but I thought, you know, hey, that is really, it's simple, effective, right? Goes back to the basics. Um, but, you know, this is, this is what we hear, right? So I'm building my own toolbox, but then I get a client, and the client says, but I always use this one, you know? And so, but my friend said, Right? Oh, this, this one was good. Well, what value? Who's your friend? Why does he, what does he know about WordPress? What does he know about themes and plugins? How much years of experience does he have using these tools? You know, it's, and so these are the kind of things that you're going to hear, the avoidance of the pain point of changing based on you presenting your toolbox is the avoidance that you're going to get from people. Uh, you know, oh, no, or, or it's the simple, you're going to use this one or else. Like, well, you don't get my work, right? So what do you do, right? You can either suck it up and use it and go, oh, this is going to be a painful. Or you can be uh, a human and say, no, I don't work like that. Um, that's not part of my workflow. My workflow is to strategize for you, is to give you the tools and technology that I've spent half of a, or a quarter of my lifetime developing for you, know, for you uh, uh, and bringing to you. Um, so those kind of words are being thrown around, but we have to have the confidence to say no, right? Um, you know, the idea that this one seems okay without any kind of background knowledge, right? Or, or I use Theme Black Forest, which I like to add. And, and then when you hear that, you're like, you groan because then you know that you, 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 someone lost a license key. You can't get a license key until you're logged into Theme Forest. And if you're not logged in, and then there's every support form is different for every different tool that you use, right? So in my workflow, makes Theme framework has a page builder called Make Plus. So I've seen someone recently actually install Avada Fusion, which has a page builder, but then install Visual Composer on top of that. So that's, what sense does that make? I have no idea. Does everybody know what Visual Composer is? Raise your hand. Some people? Okay. Um, when I talk about page builders, I talk about um, uh, theme frameworks are now advanced to the point where we can select the layout grid of our pages and posts. We can hide sidebars, we can move sidebars around, we can build menu structures, all these kind of cool things, um, build banners, sliders, carousels, without having to hire a developer. It's all in the framework. So if you have a theme that has a framework, well, Visual Composer is a plugin that is a page builder. So if you have a theme that has a page builder and you add a plugin that has a page builder, what sense does that make? 
right? That means you haven't done your homework. So that's, you know, that's part of what, what, when we talk about our workflow, it's understanding the tools that we're putting to use and how powerful they are and how they can conflict, right? Um, you know, there's the let's just install it avoidance, there's the conflicts that that, that, that ensues, there's the they're just going down that road anyway, right? And there's, a, you know, uh, I like to do, let's use, e you know, not just in development, but, um, you know, when I talk about workflow, I also talk about communication, like Basecamp, Trello, Slack, these kinds of things. You know, and we get the, oh, let's just use email, like text me. You know how many texts I get from some of my clients who try to send me something by text that just doesn't, shouldn't come through text, right? So those are workflow issues um, that we have to mitigate against. And I just um, talk about them just to, trigger um, the light bulb in your head and go, yeah, why am I getting texts from my clients when they keep on telling me to, telling them to use this tool to communicate? So we have to push back in our workflow and make it work for us, you know, and make, and yes, help the client make it work for them too, but there has to be some common ground because the more clients and, and developers and people go off the grid and don't follow the framework, it's a time suck, it's a, you know, it's a time cost, right? It's a repetition, right? All those things we try to mitigate against in our workflow so we can limit the impact on our daily productivity, right? Um, so I, this is the, I, you know, what do we do, right? We beat our head against the wall, right? But I can't remember if managing it is an art or a science. I'm like, ah! You know, I love, I love that. I just had to add that one in. Um, but I say stop, right? Just stop. Stop everything. Stop your developers, stop your clients, have a conversation. Talk about your strategies. Talk about why you do what you do. Convince um, uh, them uh, and inspire them with your knowledge and say, you know, I'm moving, it's the leadership, I'm moving us forward and I need you to buy into my idea. Like, you know, there's one developer, if I'm using Git, he's using Bitbucket. But I'm the business owner. I'm paying you, and my, I have an idea behind my head that my other developers are going to use Git. But if you're the only one out here using Bitbucket, and you keep on telling me that's what you like, well, I can't work with you. Because I have to standardize my workflow for everyone, not just for you. Right? And there are so many tools, as we've seen, that everyone's throwing things at you and saying, oh, I'll use this. And if you start doing that, it just fa it fails. You fail, it fails, the project fails, because everybody's throwing their ideas and you're trying to be a good person to everyone. And it's not that you can't be good to everyone, but you have to be firm and you have to say, I'm sorry, you know, this is the way that I've structured my business. This is the way that our platform works. And if you want to work with us, then I'm asking you to, to buy into the culture of my tribe. And if you don't buy into the culture of my tribe, you know, then you're unfortunately not going to be part of my tribe. Or you're going to be part of their tribe because that's, if that's the tribe you want to be in. And, and, you know, it's a hard lesson to learn. I've been let go of companies um, for, you know, one reason or another. And I've excelled at companies and I have my own company and I'm part of all kinds of different tribes. So I see it. But some people who don't experience that don't understand it. They just think it's always their way or no way. Um, so lead your tribe. You know, be the leader of your tribe, exude the confidence, explain why your methods work for your business and their brand. So there's two ways to look at it. There's your internal tribe, and then there's the client's tribe, right? And for example, one client came to me with an Avada Fusion problem, and I could have said, no, I don't want to deal with it, but I then said, well, you know, I want to learn Avada Fusion. I don't really want to make it part of my tribe, but I got some weeks, I'll dabble in it and see how it works. So I did that. I didn't kick, I didn't kick back the client and say, no, I can't work with you. You don't fit within my tribe framework. I'm not saying that you have to be a stick in the mud, but I'm saying that a framework for your tools and technology that you use and apply uh, is important. Um, there's potential cost, right? There's a plus minus, there's ease of use, there's simplicity, there's duplication. You know, some people um, you know, may duplicate efforts, right? Uh, just by using different tools when you really want to standardize on one. Those are hard conversations to have, which I just mentioned. And 
you know, there's an education component of you have to really know and understand what tools you're using and what, and what your workflow is to be able to educate and lead and inspire others on those tools. So I just implore you to think about that, that it is, you know, your responsibility. I have to educate myself. I expect all of you to educate yourselves. Um, my wife sometimes says to me, uh, I don't feel like it. I don't know. I don't want to. I don't want to look at that. I don't want to learn it. Just show me. I say, but you know, you're an international educator and study abroad, teaching students all these things, and you don't want to learn yourself. You know, so that's not a good. Maybe she's tired. Okay, you know, other things going on. But to hear that back from an international educator that says to me, well, why, why should I try? If she's not going to try, then why should I try? But no, I try because I want to inspire all of you. I try because I want to make sure that my workflow that I put in place that I standardize around, you know, solves those problems, right? Um, so they had to a toolbox, you know, but we already use, sometimes you're stuck and that's okay by, you know, your journey, that's right. I, I, talk, I talked about this uh, with the fusion uh, issue. Um, be flexible but firm in your convictions. And other times remove and replace as long as it works and doesn't increase cost or, uh, or client internal, external agrees to pay costs, you know, time and labor deadlines if necessary, right? So sometimes you can just replace stuff. Like if somebody's using Ninja Forms and you hate Ninja Forms and you want to use Gravity Forms because that's in your workflow, then use Gravity Forms, replace it. Client doesn't know. They just want the form to work, right? Don't, you don't have to ask them to say, oh, you know, well, we really use this one and would it be okay? They don't even know what the tool does. They just want a form on their site so somebody can actually enter some data into it. So sometimes you make the decision yourself because you're confident, you're the leader, you, you express that confidence and, and you make things happen, right? So, um, so these are some of the tools, I guess I deleted that top thing. This is just some of the tools in my own personal toolbox. I use Basecamp for simple project collaboration with clients, tasks, and timelines. I store project assets there, I write little notes, you know, I communicate. Now, Basecamp's been around a while, and there's Asana, and there's this one new one, and there's that new one, and all these new tribes are coming and say, join my tribe, you know, but I'm sticking with Basecamp because I like what Basecamp does. It's simple for me and my clients. And that's what Basecamp wanted me to know, is to provide a simple communications tool. So I standardize around that. All my clients go on Basecamp. If they don't like it, tough. You can text me and email me. If I don't get it, oh, you weren't on Basecamp? Sorry, I didn't see it, right? Trello for agile sprints with cards for back, with product backlog items. So if anybody knows Trello, raise your hand. Trello? Okay, Trello is a, a card-based project management system, for those who don't know. You set up a card that has a task. Say, uh, you know, add social media icons. And then you can communicate on that card. Then you can move it between boards uh, and say, you can move it down the board and say, oh, this is a backlog item, now it's moved into development, now it's moved into this, that, QA, launch, you know, staging, launch, whatever. So Trello is a good tool for, um, for working with your developers. So uh, I also use Harvest app for project time tracking. Um, my Harvest app syncs to my QuickBooks as well as my Wells Fargo account. So I do time tracking, which then triggers an invoice, which then triggers an email to the client who can then pay online, which then goes into my, into my Wells Fargo account, which then triggers QuickBooks to say I received a payment. And at the end of the year, I just go and reconcile, boom, give them my accountant, and that's my workflow. Right? Makes it much easier than writing out, you know, an invoice and sending it in the mail or using three different tools and getting, trying to wait for a check or get PayPal money, you know. Um, so Harvest is tied to Stripe, which is the payment processor. It takes the payment and then sends the payment to Wells Fargo in a couple of days and then Wells Fargo gets that payment, hits QuickBooks, right? And so it makes it easier. It's all automated. I don't have to write stuff anymore. I just trigger, oh, I worked 30 hours on this project in my time tracking tool. Boom, it creates the invoice, itemized, goes out, the money comes in. Standardizing your workflow, right? Instead of having to, you know, have pain points and, and trying to do your billing. Evernote I use for note taking um, because it has a mobile app uh, and, um, and a desktop app and it's pretty powerful and it syncs with other tools. I'm using Slack more and more. There's a WordPress, there are uh, uh, many WordPress channels on Slack for the many different uh, elements of WordPress that you can join and get involved um, with WordPress on Slack. But I use it, I have a digital strategy works account and I jump in on other people's accounts from time to time. Team Viewer, 
uh, is a team viewer appeared. Now here's where standardization falls, right? It's like there's another, there's a whole world of people who want your attention for web video conferencing, right? And so everybody's using, oh, this guy uses Cisco's thing, and that guy uses uh, go to training, and this one uses go to meeting, and that one uses join.me. You just have to say, I'm going to do this one. Because you just can't, if you're the lead on the meeting, don't ask the client which one they want to use. Tell the client you're using this. Freeconferencecall.com, here's my phone number, call in, boom. We can't waste time with our clients having them tell us, because they don't know. Right? We have to tell them, if, you want to do a, if we want to do a screen share, share, then you have to download TeamViewer, and you have to load it in. It's pretty simple to do. Everybody does it. You know, it's 2017, so download it. It's free, right? Just do it, and, and we'll communicate. You know, people have to get educated, and we have to, we have to provide the, um, the impetus for them to do so. But those are some of the tools that I use. You know, go to training is important because you can, you can actually charge for webinars and get pay, uh, PayPal payments um, for webinars. So that's a good way. And they also do like uh, after this webinar um, QA that they send out so you can get feedback. And uh, they store audio uh, and video of the webinar and all the slides. And you can charge, you know, upcharge for that. So those are kind of cool tools um, for, for the webinar world. Uh, Google Calendar I use for online meetings just to say, hey, you know, GCAL, get a GCAL, right? If you don't have a Gmail address nowadays, I, I just don't know. If I have to send you a Google Calendar invite to hot Hotmail, I mean, it's, it's, I just don't know. I just, I shake my head and, uh, but you know, but Google's watching everyone and they're gonna read, all, they, everybody reads your stuff. Does, don't you think Hotmail, Microsoft? didn't read your stuff. So um, Dropbox for sharing large files. Some people like box.com or other services like you send it, um, but I use Dropbox uh, for sharing large files because customers have to pass you assets all the time and, and they can't, e they try to email them and that's not good workflow, right? You can't email me. Uh, my client yesterday sent me a text, a text and said I tried to email you a 700 megabyte WAV file right, for a podcast that I want, I'm, I'm like, Jason, I told you to email me an MP3, oh, I don't know how to do MP3, okay, just get, get Dropbox, send me the file, I will work on exporting it to MP3 in your workflow, right? Um, uh, cloud up, cloud app, uh, to, cloud up is, is owned by uh, Automatic now, I think, um, great uh, screenshot tool, um, cloud app for screenshots and screen records, I also use Camtasia, for screen records when I have to do um, a training uh, or something like that for a, a client um, where I want to, you know, do a walkthrough and then I can annotate um, that walkthrough on video, which is pretty neat. Uh, and then email is the last resort, of course, right? So um, my toolbox for invoicing, I talked about this, generate and send invoices from Harvest, take payments through Stripe, deposit sent to the bank, QuickBooks connected to the bank, and Stripe for reconciliation. Now you can use Xero. Um, if you're familiar with Xero for this, I just happen to use QuickBooks because I like it. Um, I think they both do the same thing. I think they're both great um, software as a service applications. Uh, and you don't get QuickBooks anymore as a download. You sign up online uh, and they have a mobile app. So it's a software as a service online now. Not necessarily I go to Staples and buy QuickBooks and install it on my computer, right? Um, my toolbooks box for themes. So when, um, when I... As I was evolving and, and doing custom development and building websites for, for people, most of my freelance full stack developers child themed the theme framework from WordPress like 20, 2012 or 2013 or 2014 or whatever have you. Um, but then page builders came along and I, I, I just saw that two years ago and I thought, oh wow, you know, I can really kind of do this stuff myself now. I don't necessarily, for small clients without big budgets, I can use page builders in my workflow and I don't, now I can eliminate the cost of a full stack developer. I can use a page builder, I can child theme that page builder with all the tools and, and options that are built in um, to that and ship off my websites faster. Um, maybe they're not as elegantly designed, but we're looking for simplicity and, and, and uh, speed to market, right? 
And so I bet the farm on Theme Foundry. Some of you bet the farm on Divi, right? But that's your choice. You decided that would work within your framework, and then you ask all your new clients who come to you to move to Divi because that is the system that you know, and that's the system that then you want your developers to know and that you pay for and that you get support for, right? And so it's not wrong to ask people to adhere to that. Um, it does get tricky when someone says, I'm not gonna, I can't inherit that cost. So you're gonna have to work within what I have. Now, Avada's Fusion, so for example, um, Theme Foundry, uh, they use the WordPress customizer. Anybody know what the customizer is? Raise your hand. I wanna see how many people know. Okay, some people don't know. Uh, most theme frameworks in the last six or eight years built their own theme options panel. So you would go to your left hand uh, admin bar and you would go under appearance and you would see theme options. And when you clicked on theme options, you would see a panel with a bunch of tabs and it would give you all kinds of options to customize the theme, right? WordPress created this uh, uh, um, kind of pseudo staging environment with a tool called Customizer that, that is a theme options panel that Make has said, instead of building our own theme options panel, we will inherit all the rules in the API and the customizer and we'll use that. And I go, I, I said, that a light went off in my head. I said, no more, thank God, no more theme options panel of your own. Because what happens with theme options panels is that when you leave a theme, you leave all the options from the old theme in the database and you disconnect them. The new theme's not gonna inherit them right, because they were created by the old theme. And now they're stuck in your database. You can't suck them out and use them in the new theme, right? So WordPress decided we'll build a customizer to have API calls for everyone to build their theme options panels this way. That way they can be interchangeable if people are using the same API calls, right? Um, so that's workflow, right? That's part of workflow is deciding and defining how I'm gonna work with a theme, and I decided I'm going to work with Make because they adopted the customizer, got rid of the theme options panel, and that works for me. And now it makes it easy for me to, to the 20 sites that I manage right now, go into each one and know exactly where everything is instead of having to go to Fusion and Genesis and this thing and that thing and not know where all my controls are. So I've standardized my process across all my client sites and now it, it, it makes it easier for me, it makes it easier for them, it's less costly for everyone. That's the benefit, but convincing someone on that benefit is, is another thing altogether. It is challenging, I'm not going to, to lie. I didn't say to my last client, you need to change from Avada Fusion to this, because she really didn't. I, could, I sort of figured it out, but I still run my business on Make and she can continue on that. If she wants to come for more work, then we can have that conversation about converting her down the road. Did you say that was a, a framework? It's a framework with a Make Plus Companion plugin that adds additional page builder elements like WooCommerce um, support and stuff like that to Make Plus. Um, so just like Divi, um, you know, just like any one of these theme frameworks that have add-on page builder, you know, tools and stuff, um, they're all they're all competing for our attention. So. I think in, in a, in when you're standardizing your workflow, you have to decide, because if you don't, you just get sucked into this world of, of, of having to manage everyone else's thing when, you, when it's gonna be a big time suck and a learning curve for all the things that you do, right? Um, so I've developed a great rapport with the support team. So you, when you get a theme framework, some people buy, like she bought a Vada Fusion um, and she's a digital, she's a social media expert going out selling herself as that, but she bought Theme Fusion and she didn't even know where to go get support. So I had to tell her, like, you have to go back into Theme Forest and ask for support to, to find out how do you upgrade this based on a security issue, right? But I am always talking to my Theme Foundry developers. I know what my logins are. I know where my license key is, right? Part of your workflow, know where your license keys are right? Know where to save them, know where to share them with your clients when they need those license keys if you fall off the face of the earth, right? 
um, and how to you know how to inherit. That's part, you know part of your workflow is to tell your you know tell your clients we're going to be using this theme. Here's the license key. You know I've registered it, but if you're going to if if it expires on this day, but when it expires, if I'm not around for some reason, I get hit by a bus, then you're going to have to renew, add the license key here, those kinds of things. Those simple standardization processes that we don't do or we forget to do. Um, in my plugin toolbox, I use Jetpack. Some people complain, some developers complain that Jetpack is bloated. I don't necessarily care that it's bloated. I think it's an amazing plugin and it has spe very specific tools that I use for social sharing. They have a social share bar. Um, you can get a social share bar from 100 different plugin developers, but I'd rather get it from Automatic. So in my workflow, I want tools from Automatic. I think Automatic knows what they're doing. Whether developers think it's bloated or not, I trust Automatic. I'm putting Jetpack in my workflow, right? Um, also, there's um, cross-posting, you know, to LinkedIn, to Google+, to Facebook. You know, there's that publicizes in Jetpack. So I want all my clients to have that. I could go out and get all the latest, greatest, but simplicity was key for me. Uh, Akismet for spam, which we all should know, it's an automatic product. Uh, All-in-one SEO pack, I don't use Yoast. Um, I use All-in-one SEO for various reasons. I think it's um, a, a stronger plugin for professional SEOs, but that's my personal opinion. Um, Gravity Forms, I use um, uh, uh, religiously. Um, and so I use them on every site. So that way when I have a problem, I go to Gravity Forms, not Ninja today and Gravity tomorrow and this form the next day. I can have a conversation with people who are going to get to know me, know my process, know how to answer my questions. Right? WooCommerce and Card66, I employ the event calendar plugin. Um, is a really cool, and by the way, these slides are obviously going to be on SlideShare uh, after this uh, and posted, so you don't necessarily have to write everything down. You'll, you'll get them. Uh, Often Monster is a great um, uh, popover, you know, uh, and then we have to look at, well, what's going on in the popover market? Well, Google has now said if popovers are blocking content in mobile, then we're going to hit you, hit your, uh, hit your um, um, page authority and domain rank, right, uh, against that. So Often Monster quickly adhering, you know, they're in the WordPress universe. They're professional. Yeah, I pay for it. We can always find free. But sometimes free, you know, becomes a problem. And I'm not saying that we should always pay for plugins. We should, you know, find a good balance. But OptiMonster provides exactly what I need, exactly for what I need for all my clients. They're always releasing new features, and I put them in my toolbox, right? WP Smush come, is an image optimization plugin. They talked about that in page speed optimization. I think it's a good plugin. There's a pro version. Um, that will go back and smush all your images that you have. So if you have a big photo site and you want to do them all at once, you'll have to, you'll have to buy the pro version. Um, Cloudflare I use to get free SSL. Some people use Let's Encrypt, but Cloudflare inherently has free SSL when you move, migrate your DNS. So in my workflow, I migrate all my clients' DNS from GoDaddy, from this place, from that place, and I manage all my clients' DNS under my one control panel in Cloudflare. And that helps me because now I don't have to log in to five different DNS control panels at five different domain name service providers. Now I can just log in to Cloudflare and change a DNS entry if I have to add a subdomain or something like that really, really quickly. It helps me with my workflow, right? Ad Sanity is a good plugin for hosting ads uh, in your sidebars and in your pages and posts. Uh, Edit Flow. Um, this is a great plugin for journalists and people who have who are doing content management with a lot of writers to manage their writers. It doesn't get as much support as it should, even though WordPress has taken it over. Um, but I still think it's a good uh, plugin for for that. Co-authors Plus helps you have two authors of a post, or three authors, or four authors. So you can have, instead of having one author, um, you know, you can do like Joe and Jane wrote this post instead of just Joe, right? Blueberry PowerPress is a podcasting plugin that's pretty advanced, and it helps you sign up with iTunes and Google Play Store and Stitcher and other, um, iTunes, uh, other podcast distributors. Google Analytics Dashboard puts Google Analytics right in your dashboard as, a, as a, um, a, a panel view, and you don't get all the great stuff from Google Analytics, but at least you get a quick view 
of what you're doing in your, in your GA uh, account. Um, video background plus is cool because we're now doing these video backgrounds. But um, I don't know if, if you know what I mean by video background when, you're, when your home interstitial is no longer a banner, but it's actually a video with some text over it. You know, it, it shows movement. A lot of people are starting to do this nowadays because sliders are, are going by the wayside. Um, so I use video background plus, but make just rolled out video backgrounds in make. So now I can eliminate that plugin and now make is supporting that. So that's, you know, that now goes into my workflow, right? Move, remove one when one's introduced and bring in the other. Feature video plus. So anybody wanted to know how to get a video to be featured, this is a great plugin for that. It, it works with all, um, all the uh, embed video services. Um, that WordPress supports, like you know, in Motion and or Daily Motion and Vimeo and YouTube and blah blah blah. But instead of having a featured image, you have a featured video, right, over your post or your page. Uh, and WP Charitable. I know there's another. Um, the other guys out here are good too, uh, in terms of donation uh, services and plugins and whatnot. And you know, this isn't my entire tool set, but I'm just giving you some examples. Uh, I looked in my, in my workflow, I work with a lot of restaurants. So now I need to implement menu systems. I worked to research hundreds, not hundreds, I'm sorry, I should say, uh, maybe 10 or 15 menu plugins, and they all fell short. But I found a software as a service with a WordPress plugin called Open Menu that is a very powerful menu system um, for restaurants. And I've adopted that for East Village Grill here in Asheville. Uh, another site in New York is going to get that, and it allows you can have multiple rest, mul man manage multiple restaurants um, with Open Menu. So that's collapsing your workflow again, right? Instead of multiple different plugins and different sites and not knowing, you have one software as a service application. And I'm also doing something for Ohm Sanctuary. If anybody's familiar, we're moving them to Checkfront, which is another. Uh, uh, property management system. There's another software as a service, right? So it's looking for, workflow is looking for the tools that are going to advance your client's interest, but give you stability, security, support, and all the things that you need um, to make sure that you can run your business because well, you're only one person if you're an independent owner like me. Or you might be two or three people, but you, you have the reliance on those people to make sure that the products that you're choosing in your workflow work for you, work for your client, and, and they get supported and you get you know, the value um, that, you, that you need, right? So in hosting, this was dreadful. <laughs> Cheap, crap, shared hosting. Yeah, cPanels look great. They got a lot of cool stuff that you can do, but I finally said, no more shared hosting. Too many problems with hack sites, too many problems with site slowdowns, because uh, it's a share, shared environment. So three or four years ago, we moved into trying to do managed hosting ourselves um, with the company that actually supports WP Engine called Linode. And I became sort of a quasi system administrator. But in my workflow of sales, support for my clients, maintenance, account management, I couldn't actually be a system administrator. So I had to recognize that in myself. That can't be part of my workflow. So who's coming on board to take that over? Oh, well, Linode works with WP Engine. I've heard of WP Engine, boom, sign up for WP Engine. Not only am I a client of WP Engine, I recommend all my clients, and I'm an affiliate now. So I get $200 per site um, when somebody signs up for WP Engine. They have an affiliate program. So that puts more revenue in my pocket, or I do host some of my client sites on my own not, uh, 10 block. Uh, uh, plan and I have residual revenue that way. So that's how I've worked hosting into my workflow, is to have some clients I host that I can manage and some clients who are bigger than me, you know, I say go and go and I can still get a $200 payment from that because they bought their hosting through me, right? So I got off that, moved to WordPress manual hosting with WP Engine. I'm sure Flywheel, who are outside here, um, just like WP Engine, provide the same level of support and service. I just happen to chose WP, and they happen to be a competitor. So either way you slice it, you're, I'm sure you're, you're going to be in good hands, right? Um, why did I choose WP Engine? Because they had daily backups. Now I don't have to put in my workflow Backup Buddy or Vault Press or some other service, right? I have a staging environment. Not only do I have a staging environment, but WP Engine backs up staging and live every day, both. 
so I can have a backup of staging and a backup of live, right? They have Git connectivity for all my developers if I need it. They have SFTP, secure file, you know, FTP. They have 24-hour chat support. They have multi-site um, support. They do free SSL too if you don't want to use Cloudflare. And now they just introduced push storage to Amazon. So if you max out, max out on their storage, you can sign up for an Amazon um, CloudFront account and push all your storage from WP Engine into Amazon. So I'm not a system administrator, but I'm able to do all these things in my workflow with WP Engine, right, as one individual, right, which really is truly amazing. Um, and so I just was talking about billing clients for hosting and stuff. Um, what did I do with email, right? Five minutes, thank you. Moved email to Google's G Suite. I don't know why someone, I have a client who has uh, web.com email, and every month, I get a call from my clients. Oh, yeah, I have a maintenance contract with them. Can you call WP, you know, web.com? There's something wrong. This thing, that thing, that whatever. And, you know, I never, I have never, ever, ever. Anybody ever have a problem with Gmail? I've never, ever had a problem with Gmail. And I know it's $5 a month per account, and you can get a discount codes to make it like $4.20 per month. And I'm affiliate, I am an affiliate of G Suite. And I actually signed up for a G Suite affiliate, so I have that revenue stream in my workflow, right, um, to recommend to my clients. But, uh, but yeah, I moved all my emails to G Suite, and then I can have all my team on G Suite, and you know, the Google Hangouts and all the cool tools, Google Docs, Google Drive, Google Calendar, right, are all part of my workflow now, right? Better spam protection, other integrated services, you know, all the things I just talked about, better team collaboration, right? Agreements, I've used Adobe Sign, so I can send back and forth agreements for signature, or DocuSign is another service, there are a few out there. Contractually just got bought, and I don't, I think they're enterprise level now, so um, they're pri priced out of my range. Um, or, in a uh, estimate in Harvest, I just put all my terms, and if you accept the estimate, you've accepted the terms, right? Instead of having to sign a document back and forth. So I put that into my workflow to make it easier for me to, um, to get contracts signed, right? So use, clay, use cases, I just, with, for Total Merchant Resources, a client of mine, I removed Ninja Forms in favor of Gravity Forms. Client didn't know how they, how they even got Ninja Forms, nor did they know where the license key was. And so I rebuilt and launched new forms in Gravity Forms. And since then, you know, they've had 250 registrations and they haven't had one hiccup and it's been a, a good relationship. Use case two, you know, client has an unsupported theme from ThemeForce, which to make theme form, framework by Theme Foundry. Now client has support for theme and page builder, you know, which I've implemented easier for me to manage. I don't have to go into ThemeForce, look for the theme developer, try to wait for some guy who lives in India to ca call me back, you know, or get back to me, right? Um, use case three, client using SEO, we talked about this was not using fullest extent, switch to all-in-one, import, export data, no cost to the client, it was an hour of my time. So those are some of the things that, um, that uh, uh, I've done to improve my workflow uh, over the course of the history of managing um, web development and client services. Um, and so if I, I invite questions, if you have questions. Oh, MailChimp. Yeah, I should have mentioned that. Mail I like MailChimp. I mean, I have a client that uses Constant Contact. Um, I'm not mad at that, but I, I never log into their Constant Contact. Um, but I, I, I use MailChimp, and I, have, I probably have six MailChimp accounts from clients that I log into and manage email newsletter marketing for. And they've now, they're now doing marketing automation as well for free, so they're trying to compete with HubSpot. So I'm hopeful that that is a tool that I can use, but I've had a lot of success with MailChimp, and they're very startup friendly with free accounts up to 12,000 emails a month, um, depending on how you send them, so, so it's pretty cool. Anybody else have any questions? No? Yes? How do you approach keeping your toolbox updated? So you, over the years, found these tools that work for you. How do you know whether to use Gravity Forms as a guide versus checking out what's out there tomorrow? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. It really comes to, you know, I'm buying into the fact that these companies are going to be there for the long term. And I'm watching their development, and I'm meeting them at places like this, and I'm talking to them and saying, what are you going to do to service me as a customer, 
right, uh, over the long term. Um, most form builds are pretty simple. Um, I have one insanely complex form build um, that Gravity Forms handles well. And then there's, um, there's some things that they didn't build in. So there's a new company called Gravity Perks that builds plugins for Gravity Forms. So I'm, I'm, you know, I have to be hopeful that they, because some of the plugins that I'm using for Gravity Forms are coming from Gravity Perks to do certain things and sliders and stuff like that in the form builder. I mean, you can never be sure. You just have to be confident and bet the farm. You know, I mean, we all have to bet the farm on something, you know, at some point and say, this is, you know, will there be a time? You know, there's been Asanas of the world, the Jira's, but I still use Basecamp. Basecamp serves its need. It does it well. It's a stable company. I know who they are, and I pay my 19 bucks a month, and I get quality of service. So that's what I, that's what I look for. So when new things come along, you know, all, uh, Jetpack has an SEO plugin in it now, right? But that's a paid upgrade to Jetpack when all-in-one SEO is free. You know, is, is, is Jetpack's SEO plugin going to really do what all-in-one SEO does? No, because all-in-one SEO has social meta management and other tools that I need, you know, that aren't in Jetpack. So I could look at it, and then I, but I say I'm confident and comfortable that I'm working with people and I talk to Michael and Steve from all in one. I'm on, you know, I, I present at WordCamp Raleigh. I go, you know, I do their webinars. I talk to them. And so it's just being active, you know. It's not, it's to say don't fall short and go uh, and forget about it. Like be active in those communities. They're all their own tribes and you have to join those tribes just as much as you have to build your own tribe, right? Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yeah, does. Okay, thank you. All right, well, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Yeah.